My name is David Taylor, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about the structure and function of CRISPR-Cas surveillance complexes. So the outline for my talk today is to first tell you a little bit about the structure of a novel type 4 CRISPR-Cas complex that hasn't been characterized yet to date. Um, and then second, I'm going to talk to you about the mechanisms of improved specificity for some of the high fidelity Cas9 variants that exist today. But first, I want to give a brief introduction to the method that I use for most of my research, which is single particle cryoelectron microscopy. So in single particle cryo EM, what we do is we bring an electron beam through the sample and the particles are trapped in ice. And so as the electron beam comes through the sample, it creates a projection image. That projection image is noisy and it has our particles trapped in all orientations, which allows us to later create the 3D structure, but we have to get rid of that noise first. So in order to get rid of the noise, what we do is we box out individual particle images after boxing out those individual particle images, we're able to classify them into discrete groups, usually based on the projection view that the particle exists in. And so in this particular example, there's class one, which represents the side view of the particle, and class two, which represents the top view of this particular particle. And so once you've done this alignment and classification, you can average particles within the same class together. And after you do this averaging, you get uh, class averages, and these averages have uh, increased signal noise ratio. You can start to see uh, structural features, especially secondary structure features. So those little rod-like densities, which we call sausages or alpha helices in those particular uh, class averages. And then through other uh, image reconstruction techniques, finally, we're able to get a 3D structure of the complex. And so this is a 3D structure of a symmetrical object. It doesn't come out color-coded like that from the reconstruction process. We have to do that later, and that is time-intensive, but also fun. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is structures of CRISPR-Cas surveillance complexes. And so what is CRISPR-Cas? So here's an E. coli, here's an electron micrograph of an E. coli cell being attacked. Uh, by phages, and these phages are attaching to the E. coli cell and they're injecting their viral genome into it with the idea of infecting it and killing the E. coli cell. And so one mechanism that bacteria have come up with to fend off these uh, phage infections is CRISPR-Cas systems, a type of adaptive immunity. And so how does this work? Well, in the first step, there's the immunization part, where that genomic DNA from the virus is cut into pieces and integrated into the CRISPR loci um, in between these invariant repeat sequences. And so later, that re repeat CRISPR loci is transcribed into a pre-CRISPR RNA. The pre-CRISPR RNA is processed into a mature CRISPR RNA. That mature CRISPR RNA is then loaded into an effector complex um, which we call cascades, and that CRISPR RNA guides the effector complex to its target so that it can cleave the target or degrade it in another way, and that's in the immunity stage of CRISPR-Cas um, adaptive immunity. Okay, so there's two main classes of CRISPR-Cas uh, complexes. There's class one, which are the multi-subunit complexes typified by uh, E. coli's type 1E cascade. There's also the type two single subunit complex. This is where the CRISPR craze started. These single polypeptides um, have been repurposed for uh, various genome engineering applications and have a lot of problems for therapeutic um, applications. What I'm going to talk to you today about for stru structure-wise is the class one uh, complexes. And so here's from uh, actually an outdated review article now, but just shows you kind of the breadth and depth of uh, the diversity of these class one CRISPR-Cas systems. So there's the type one, they can be divided up further in the type one uh, systems, usually target DNA. And then there's the type three complexes, which target RNA, they also target DNA, but um, uh, we'll, for our purposes, we'll say they're targeting RNA. And there's recently identified type four complexes. 
And so many of these class one CRISPR systems remain to be characterized. Um, and so we're going to focus today on these type four complexes, which are really uncharacterized. And so this is a collaboration uh, between my laboratory and the laboratories of Ryan Jackson and Raymond Stalls and some uh, great uh, graduate students and postdocs that are in their lab. And uh, a postdoc in my laboratory, uh, Yi Zhao. So what we did is we overexpressed uh, the proteins from a type four complex in a mycobacterium in E. coli, and we pulled down using a tag on one of the subunits. After pulling down, we froze grids and we were able to collect micrographs on our Titan Creos here at UT Austin. And the circles, uh, yellow circles show individual particles um, that we were able to see in these motion corrected micrographs. And from those micrographs, we were able to collect, uh, we were able to create reference free 2D class averages that show clear secondary structure features and a warm like particle. And so after the 3D reconstruction, we were able to obtain a structure at around 3.9 angstrom's resolution. And you can see from the structure as it's rotating that it has a helical backbone of large subunits and then a CRISPR RNA in the middle and then a small filament that creates the belly um, subunits that are in different colors of red to orange. So we were able to build an atomic model into that reconstruction, and here's what the model looks like. So you can see that the large subunit or the CSF2 subunits that are in gray and blue run, run and create this helical backbone. Then there's the belly subunits that create a smaller helical backbone, and these are the CSF4 proteins. And then if you look at the very right-hand side, you can see the CRISPR RNA snaking through of the complex. Okay, so what can we glean from this crystal structure? Well, from this atomic model. So first is to look at the backbone subunit. So if we look at the type four backbone subunit, which is in gold compared to a type three backbone subunit, um, you can see that they are almost superimposable. It has a RMSD of approximately two angstroms. You can see that it shares this common uh, palm domain and then this thumb uh, region at the top. And so if you were to take one of those backbone subunits and place it on top of the filament of the other um, complex, you'd be able to see how well the rest of them overlay if you didn't, it, all things being equal, you didn't change anything else. And so if you do that, you can see that actually they overlay quite well. So um, if you, if you use one uh, for alignment, they all um, will kind of align to each other. So the backbone of the type four complex is relatively conserved with that of the type three complex uh, from CMR. Okay, and most importantly, if you look at this conserved aspartate uh, residue, you'll see that it is conserved in its position roughly between uh, both the large subunits of the type four complex and the type three complex. And this um, residue has been uh, shown to be important for the catalytic activity of the RNA cleaving uh, properties of this um, uh, complex, at least for the type three. And so that gives us some hints um, into the type four function. And so our, our hypothesis is that the type four cascade cleaves RNA similar lead to a type three complex. So on the right-hand side, you could see a type three complex that I solved as a postdoc at Berkeley with Jennifer Doudna. And in this particular complex, we have both the CRISPR RNA and a target RNA bound to it. And on the left, you'll see uh, the type four complex. Um, again, looks very similar in this particular complex. We don't have a target yet. Uh, but we think that it would target RNA based on the thumb having um, the catalytic residue that's similar to the type 3 complex, which doesn't exist in the type 1 cascades. 
Okay, so changing uh, directions a little bit, talk about functions of CRISPR-Cas surveillance complexes. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, some Cas9 work that we've been doing in the laboratory uh, using kinetics. So again, back to the two main classes. So we just talked about the class one uh, complexes where they're multi-subunit, do very interesting biology. But now we'll talk about the class two single uh, polypeptide effector complexes. This is a collaboration between my laboratory and Ken Johnson's laboratory here at UT Austin. Uh, we've shared two great postdocs, one's Shang Zhang and Mu Sen. Shang Zhang has gone on to an industry position. Mu Sen is still here finishing up this work. And then um, a laboratory manager, Helen Chen, in my laboratory, and KJ, an undergraduate in my laboratory. So it's a very productive collaboration between uh, kineticists and structural biologists. So what we've shown earlier is that our loop formation is the rate limiting step uh, for wild type Cas9, which we'll call SP Cas9. So, uh, upon initial binding of the DNA by Cas9, there's R loop formation, which means that the target strand is base pairing with the CRISPR RNA, and the non target strand is being um, uh, looped out away from uh, the rest of the complex. And so that will be targeted by the Rub C domain, while the target strand will be targeted by the H and H domain. And so we showed that DNA unwinding is relatively slow, one per second, com as compared to chemistry, which is fast at four per second. And so that means that the unwinding of the DNA is actually rate limiting. As soon as the DNA is unwound, the chemistry can occur. So what about these high fidelity variants that exist? So we looked at the high fidelity variants, we looked at HypoCas9, and we also looked at uh, Cas9 HF1 uh, that have been published uh, in the literature. And so you can see that um, we looked at both on-target and off-target cleavage, and on-target is a perfectly matched substrate, off-target has a three base pair mismatch at the PAM distal end, so at the very uh, end um, of the duplex away from uh, the PIM. And you can see that um, the uh, both HYPA Cas9 and Cas9 HF1 have dramatically decreased uh, catalytic activity um, compared to uh, the wild type proteins. So as opposed to a rate of one per second, we're at a rate of about 0.03 per second uh, for the proteins with the on target and then 0.003 uh, per second for when the protein is cleaving off target. And so it seems that the major effect of these high fidelity variants is to decrease um, the uh, speed at which the target can be cleaved. And so to understand how this works, we need to think of it as uh, a kinetic partitioning. So we also, not shown here, is we showed that the R loop formation rate is um, similar between all of these um, Cas9 variants in all targets. So whether or not it's a perfect match or an off target. And so something else needs to be happening. And so what we did is a kinetic partitioning experiment. Um, so where we use a comp. Uh, a competing DNA. And so in these particular experiments, we use a competing on-target DNA. And you can see that um, in the case of the wild-type enzyme, when you have an off-target, 67% of the enzyme is still committed to go forward and cleave the perfect match. Whereas when you look at HYPA-Cas9 and Cas9 HF1, when you have the off-target and you add in the competing um, wild type uh, perfect match DNA, only 24% in the HYPA case is committed to going forward, whereas 10% uh, in the case of Cas9 HF1 is committed to go forward. And so what this tells us is that there's a kinetic partitioning effect that's occurring that's leading to the observed in increases in specificity um, that are seen in vivo. And so a cartoon, I think, will help us to better understand uh, this mechanism. So now, in the case of these high fidelity variants, the DNA unwinding is fast. So it's still occurring at about one per second. So then we have the R loop created. 
but the irreversible cleavage reaction that occurs when the two strands are actually snipped by both the H&H &H and rough C domains, that's happening very slow for these enzymes, which gives the enzyme a chance to re-equilibrate and in fact eject the DNA. So going all the way back to the DNA um, uh, being rewound and then removed uh, from the enzyme. So it's, uh, you can think of it a lot like the enzymes chewing very slowly. So it's giving itself a chance to taste and see if it likes it. If it doesn't like it, there's plenty of time for it to spit the DNA substrate back out. Whereas if it quickly went through and chewed it, there's no chance for it to remove um, the DNA. And so conclusions and future directions. So uh, from the first part of the talk, type four complexes are minimal and intriguing. It's tempting to hypothesize that they target RNA based on structural similarities that they have with the type three complexes. Second part of the talk, I talked about high fidelity Cas9 variants and how they improve discrimination via kinetic partitioning. So whether to go forward with the irreversible cleavage or going backwards. And so future directions in the laboratory include determining how the type four complexes target nucleic acids. So we need to figure out which nucleic acid that it actually targets. And then um, we would like to solve structures of it in, in complex with that particular nucleic acid. And we'd also like to do some H and H labeling experiments um, that have uh, similar to those that have been done in the data lab, but with our kinetic um, uh, scheme, so in the stop flow apparatus, so that we can fit the H and H dynamics into our uh, overall kinetic model for how the Cas9 enzyme works. With that, I'd like to thank uh, the people that have already acknowledged that have done the work, and then my laboratory, which is full of uh, some great. Uh, graduate students, um, postdocs, and undergraduates. I'd like to thank funding, in particular, um, these CRISPR-related studies are funded by the Welch Foundation and the Kleberg Foundation. Uh, check us out at my website at cryoam.cns.utexas.edu, and you can follow me on Twitter at David W. Taylor Jr. And I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions, I guess, offline. Thanks.